So I want to start with a little two-question survey. Um, and my first question is, how many of you have your phone set up so that you can track it if you lose it? OK, so a lot of you, at least half, I would say. OK, now how many of you would like a stranger to be able to track your phone at all times? Nobody? <laughs> OK, so um, today I'm going to be talking about some work that we've been doing, looking at how kids think about these situations. And I'll kind of give you a, a spoiler alert and tell you the conclusion up front and then tell you how we got there. Uh, kids think about these situations very differently from how you or I would. And I hope that we get to talk about the implications of this as well. OK, so we know that GPS tracking devices are not just on our phones. They're on our keys, our backpacks, even our pets and our children. And they're increasingly tiny, which means that tracking can be a concealed activity um, that's going on and you don't even know it's going on. And I think this quote illustrates our ambivalence. Um, this was about a camera, but it's the same point. It's invasive, creepy, and perfect for a parent like me. So on the one hand, these devices can be incredibly useful, hence perfect. Uh, but at the same time, they're invasive and even creepy. Um, so why invasive and creepy? And I think there are at least two components to this that are somewhat separable. Um, so one issue is that these devices pose real dangers for people. If someone had access to your information, obviously they could use it to do you harm. Uh, they may take um, financial information, your social security number. They could even, uh, in theory, uh, steal from you, stalk you, kidnap you, spy on you. So these are serious potential harms. But in addition, there's this sense of invasion of privacy or violation of trust. Um, and I think intuiti intuitively, it feels like even if there were no harms, um, one is not comfortable with the idea of someone else having access to where you are at all times. Now, we know that most adults uh, report being very concerned about digital privacy issues. So I'm going to give you uh, a couple of slides from a study that was done of a sample of 1,000 adults in the US. Um, and they report having refused to provide personal information to a business or a company because they thought it wasn't necessary or they thought it was too personal. Uh, most people say that uh, if a photo or video of their self is uploaded to the internet, they should uh, have to have permission required before they're able to, to upload such a file. Uh, they, most people report there should be a law giving people the right to know what a website knows about them. Um, and they feel that uh, privacy issues are more problematic now compared to five years ago. So, so we know that adults care, but what about children? Um, are they aware of the benefits of being able to track information and in individuals uh, across time and space? And more importantly, are they aware of the risks? And I think this is an increasingly urgent question because the technology is zooming ahead and um, parental practices are changing rapidly in terms of what exposure children have to these devices. Um, but we know almost nothing about how children think about these things. So I'll just run through a few quick stats. So by 2009, and you know, keep in mind this is almost a decade ago, nearly a third of children eight to 10 years of age owned a cell phone. These are elementary school kids, little kids. Um, there was a 2013 survey which found that 72% of children eight or under had used a mobile device for media. And somewhat shockingly, 38% of children under two had used a mobile device for media. So, you know, I guess it's not surprising in a way that 
um, mobile media is, you know, has spread its tentacles out to us adults, but it's doing so for children as well, and often that is because uh, adults are increasingly using these. You know, if um, a parent is trying to like talk on the phone or cook dinner or something like that, she may give uh, her child the iPad to keep them busy. Um, so, so this use is, is spreading. And in 2016, the average age of first phone use was 10.3 years in the US. So, you know, I, I would argue that this potentially exposes children to, to risks that they never would have experienced before. So I think it's important to know how children are thinking about these devices and what they see as a, the pluses and minuses. And there are actually two competing predictions for how this might look for children. Um, and I will say we actually know very little about how ch children think about privacy in general, even outside the digital domain. So it's really very much an open question. But uh, nonetheless, one possibility is that children may view digital tracking as what we might call an ownership right. Um, so there's uh, a lot of work showing that young children uh, think about ownership and ownership rights and have fairly sophisticated uh, thoughts about this even as young as two years old. Um, uh, you know, not only are they insistent, this is mine, it's not yours, but they understand what the implications are for what is appropriate behavior. So it's possible that they might treat digital tracking of an object like an ownership right. Uh, just the way you can't touch my toys without my permission, maybe you can't track my toys without my permission. On the other hand, there are some differences between um, actual tracking and virtual tracking that I think might make this challenging for children. So if you think about it, um, Usually with ownership of, say, a toy, if um, I let you have it, that means I no longer have it. So it's like it, it's exclusive. One or the other of us has to have it. That's not true for tracking of information. It, if you have it, I still have it. So it may not seem as problematic for kids. A related point is that digital tracking doesn't seem to affect the object being tracked. So again, with actual ownership, uh, children are aware that if somebody else takes their stuff, they might harm it in some way, they may drop it, break it, get it dirty, and so on. And that's not the case if it's just uh, tracking of information. And then the final thing that may make an obstacle for young children in this area is that uh, parents generally try to shield children from understanding the really awful things that can happen in the world. Um, and so children may not be as aware about things like bad people who would want to steal from you. That may not be something they're even considering. So it's really kind of an open question whether children would also have that same reaction that adults do that tracking somebody else is creepy, or they may just think this is perfectly fine. So that's what we wanted to look at. And what I will tell you about today are a series of three experiments with young children designed to look at this, this issue. So in each experiment, we demonstrated a digital tracking device for children and asked if they think it's a good thing or a bad thing to use this technology. It's very, very simple, very, very stripped down kind of basic question. And most critically, we varied whether the person doing the tracking is the owner of the object being tracked or not. Very simple. And we, uh, our goal was to uh, get at children's beliefs about kind of the moral, uh, consequences and, if you, if you would, the creepiness of this kind of behavior. So um, let's start with the first experiment, which looked at children's beliefs about tracking. The children in uh, this study were four and five years of age, 
and we had a group of college students as comparison. And first we had a training procedure where we explained to kids what a digital tracking device was. And actually, um, they picked up on this really quickly. Um, so they were in the lab. We had um, a, an actual room, and then we had a bird's eye view of the room on a computer. And we had a little button. It wasn't actually a tracker, but we you know, made it seem like a tracker by use of uh, the program we had on the computer. And the kid could see that the tracker could be placed in different parts of the room. And then when they looked on the computer, they could see that little red dot in the corresponding spot. Uh, so we gave the child experience moving the tracker around, looking on the computer. We had them make predictions, like if you see it here on the computer, where do you think it is in the room? We had them uh, make the reverse uh, inference until we were very certain that they understood what this what this object did. Next, uh, we asked them um, two kinds of questions. Uh, a question about whether it was OK for they themselves to track a set of objects. And I'll, I'll tell you in a second what the objects were. Uh, and a set of questions about whether it was OK for someone else to track the object. So in the self question, for example, We'd say, here's a picture of a backpack. Now, do you have a backpack? They'd have a little chat about that. Now, let's imagine that you put this button on your backpack so you could always keep track of where your backpack is. Is it OK for you to put the button on your backpack to keep track of it? And then they had to answer, after saying yes or no, they had a scale where they could say how OK it was or how not OK it was. And then finally, they were asked to explain why. The other question was identical, except that there was this other character, Sam, um, and it was a child uh, you know, the same age as the participant. And they were asked if it was OK for Sam to put the button on the child's backpack to keep track of it. Um, so the items that we used were the participant's own backpack, uh, special object, special to them, and we had uh, we let them select their own special object. I have it um, illustrated here with a teddy bear, but sometimes it was uh, often it was some kind of special attachment object or favorite toy. Um, their pet, and if they didn't have a pet, they had to kind of come up with which pet they would most like to have, and to imagine that it was on their pet and their own elbow. So this is like the ultimate in invasive tracking. You know, if you have a device, it's actually on your body. OK, so I'm going to show you the results. Um, uh, so this shows whether they thought it was OK or not OK for the self in blue or the other person, Sam, in orange, to track these objects collapsed across the objects. Um, and I want to note that the score could go above that midpoint line or below. So abo above means that they think it's OK, and then higher means more OK. And below is they think it's not OK, and the lower is the more not OK. OK, so here are the data from the preschoolers. They uh, were sensitive to the self-other distinction so they do understand that it's more problematic to, uh, to track, for someone else to track their stuff than for them to track their stuff, um, as were the college students. The college students also showed a difference. But as you've not uh, I'm sure you've noticed, there's also this big difference between the young children and the adults. Uh, the preschoolers, on average, think it's fine for somebody else to track their stuff. And the college students were quite negative. OK, so then we looked at how they explained their answer. And we were particularly interested in when they brought in moral considerations. Uh, so here are examples of some of the things that they said that we coded as moral. And here, these examples are from um, 
either the children or the adults, uh, just to give you a sense of the coding. So if someone said it's an invasion of privacy, or if they talked about a negative consequences, she could steal it, or just a sense that it's morally wrong. I think it's wrong because it's not yours and you really shouldn't be looking for it, and so on. So I will show you how often they provided these moral explanations. Um, and we found that both preschoolers and college students provided more moral explanations when someone else was doing the tracking than the self. So they do see, they seem to see this uh, activity as a moral concern, even at the preschool age. Though again, you'll notice the developmental change, the adults were much more in tune to that than the preschoolers. And in fact, I'm going to give you a couple of quotes from, uh, these are actual quotes from an adult in the study and from a preschooler in the study. And what you'll notice is that uh, although these moral explanations did sometimes come in, the preschoolers often weren't thinking about this as a moral uh, consideration whatsoever. Um, so th these are illustrations. So for example, one uh, college student said that's a breach of privacy. Uh, preschooler said it might fall off. That's a reason why you shouldn't put the tracker on the backpack. Um, here's another example. Because he has no business to know where I am at all times. Because he can't touch anybody's backpack. So again, they seem to be um, very interested in actually the, the physical activity of putting a button on an object. What's going on with this? So uh, I will come to that with experiment two, but first, the conclusions from this first experiment. So preschoolers as well as college students were relatively more negative about a stranger versus a self tracking their own items. That seems to indicate an early emerging sensitivity to the moral considerations of uh, violating one's privacy in the digital realm. At the same time, there were these striking qualitative differences uh, with age in the absolute level of endorsement of these activities. So the college students were very clear that this was not okay for someone else to track their stuff, even when they didn't think that there would be negative, uh, actual negative consequences, they thought it was not okay, but the preschoolers were on average fine with it. But uh, we felt from experiment one, even though we had designed this experiment, as a way of assessing how people think about tracking, that maybe the preschoolers weren't focused on the tracking, but on the physical contact. Um, and so we wanted to tease apart these two pieces of it, put it, placing the button on the object and tracking the object, and to see how much of the, uh, the findings that we were, we were obtaining and the sensitivity we were seeing is due to tracking or, or not. So in experiment two, we uh, basically replicated the first experiment exactly, except that the only thing the button did was stay on the object that it was placed on. Okay, well, this is interesting because now I can't see my talk, but at least you can see it, so I can keep going. Um, you know you have 31 pending updates? <laughs> I never let it get to 31, I'm just saying. Okay. <laughs> okay, I can do this with it. I don't have to see the computer. Um, if it works. Oh, that's not good. It's not doing anything. Oh. Okay. Okay, I'll try. <laughs> um, okay, next, please. Yeah, I mean, if you if you do want to advance it. Okay, so uh, the design was the same as experiment one, but there was no tracking, um, and I'll show you exactly how that worked. Uh, we again had preschool children and college students. 
Next. Um, and so recall how we asked before, where we um, explain the function of the tracker in our training procedure. Here we had kind of an equivalent training procedure where they had the same kind of experience of seeing the tracker go on different parts of the room, but we never mentioned tracking as a function of this object. So um, again, we said that the button was really special, so we kept that constant. You can put it on places and things, and then they went through and placed it in different parts of the room, but we never showed a corresponding image of the tracker on a computer screen. Okay. Uh, you could go into the next slide, please. Okay. So the self question, uh, is it okay for you to put the button on your backpack? But we never said in order to track it, in order to keep track of where it was. Uh, so you could proceed, please. So again, they, it was placed on the image. Uh, and then for Sam, is it okay for Sam to put the button on your backpack? Okay, so we've removed the tracking dimension. Um, now, if the privacy issue is paramount, then once you remove tracking, it really should be fairly innocuous to just like put this button on, on stuff. Um, but if the, the point the kids were worried about was the physical interaction with the object, then uh, it should be just as bad to place the button as to place it and track it. Thank you very much. Um, well, it wasn't advancing, but let's see. Okay, so same items as before. I want experiment two results, not experiment three. Okay, don't look. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, good, good. Okay, experiment two. You're all with me, I hope. <laughs> okay, so is it okay or not okay? Um, as in experiment one, we again found that at both ages, it was more okay to place a button on your own stuff than for somebody else to place a button on your own stuff. So essentially, they think it's not okay for a stranger to touch your stuff, which is perfectly reasonable. Um, this time, however, children were actually more negative than college students. Remember in experiment one, kids were okay with the tracking and college students thought it was terrible. Here, um, it, it's significantly flipped. So the preschoolers think it's worse to touch somebody else, for someone to touch another person's stuff than the college students. It's the opposite from experiment one. And in order to really understand what's going on here, I want to show you the results from experiments one and two side by side. Okay, so I'll, I'll walk you through it. So first, um, when it comes to putting the button on things yourself, your own stuff, um, both preschoolers and college students think it's better if you're tracking it than if you're just placing it. You know, they, they're aware of the benefits of tracking stuff, um, and both of them are showing that they have that sensitivity to the benefits for the owner. So that's, uh, that's very clear. How about for the other person? So it's interesting that the preschoolers are showing exactly the same pattern. They think it's better if someone else is going to be putting stuff on your, uh, putting a button on your stuff, it's better if they're tracking it than if they're not tracking it. Uh, whereas college students show exactly the opposite pattern. Moral explanations, we again find uh, some moral explanations of both age groups, but here the distinction is clearer for the college students. So what does this experiment tell us? And I will say, I was surprised by those results. I was surprised that children thought it was better 
to track things than not to track things. That's essentially what they're telling us. So we found that college students view placing a device in order to track other people's stuff to be worse than merely placing a device. They're concerned about digital privacy. In contrast, preschoolers view merely placing a device to be worse than placing a device in order to track other people's stuff. So I think what's going on is when you take away that tracking function, you're removing the benefits of the tracker, which is the potential to find lost items, which they're really clued into. And it leaves just the costs of, you know, placing your hand on something that doesn't belong to you. This suggests, I think, that these young children, and remember, these are very young children, these are preschool children, they may view tracking devices strictly in terms of their benefits and may be unaware of their dangers. Okay, so the last study is um, really designed to figure out when, then, do children become aware of privacy concerns. Um, we had children uh, up through 10 years of age, remember most 10 year olds have a cell phone, uh, college students as well. And given the results of experiment two, we controlled for physical contact with the objects. Now we also varied who the owner was. So in experiments one and two, the owner was always the participant. Here we, half the time, for half the people, the owner was the participant, and for half, it was the stranger. So now instead of, how do you feel about this stranger, Sam, tracking your own stuff, the question is flipped. How do you feel about you tracking this other person's stuff? And, you know, do we find an asymmetry there? Uh, the setup was exactly the same as in experiment one. This button is really special. You can always see where it is on the computer. We had that same training process where they, um, uh, they got to learn exactly how this tracker worked, and we had various comprehension questions to make sure that they understood this. Uh, and I will give you examples of these four types of questions. So there's, again, the self-question, which you've seen before, from the child's perspective, when the child was the owner. So this is the same, pretty much, as um, what we've done previously. Uh, but this time, always the person placing the button is the owner. So the question's focused on the tracking and not on the placement plus tracking. Is it okay for you to look on a computer to see where your backpack is? Or the other person version? Is it okay, uh, uh, sorry, this is a self question, but from the other perspective. Is it okay for Sam to look on a computer to see where his backpack is? Here are the ones where the other person is the one, um, where there's that, that it, whether it's okay for somebody else to track uh, items that don't belong to them. Is it okay for Sam to look on a computer to see where your backpack is? And is it okay for you to look on a computer to see where Sam's backpack is? Again, same items. And here we have the data broken down by four, five, six to seven, eight to 10, and college. Four-year-olds, absolutely no difference. Once you take away the, the physical manipulation of someone else's stuff, they no longer care about someone else tracking your stuff at all. They think it's perfectly fine and, in fact, quite good. I mean, they have very high ratings. They're happy to have a non-owner track their stuff, and they're happy to track someone else's stuff and they don't see anything wrong with that. The five-year-olds are showing, uh, they're starting to show a, dis a distinction between these two cases, um, but this was not statistically significant. It was just a non-significant trend. It wasn't until six to seven years of age where kids 
uh, distinguish between the owner and the non-owner, and they think it's not as good for somebody else to track stuff that doesn't belong to them. What about the eight to 10 year olds? These children are now uh, you know, toward the end of elementary school. Uh, they show a stronger difference. But you might notice none of them are negative. None of them, even the eight to 10 year olds. And that's in sharp contrast to the college students. The college students, again, we find, you know, we found this every time, they really don't like the um, idea of tracking something that doesn't belong to you. And I will say, I have collapsed this over whether the participant is the owner or Sam is the owner, because it made no difference at any age. They all treated them as equivalent. They don't think it's right for themselves to track somebody else's stuff either. The moral explanations show this nice increase with age, which is similar to uh, what we found in the earlier study. So the steady increase. And adults, um, the adult responses were very interesting to me. Um, they, they often mentioned potential negative consequences, uh, stealing, stalking, kidnapping, spying. Um, they came up with some like really kind of weird, bad things that might happen that we had never even thought of. Um, <laughs> But they also just often expressed a sense of unease, like there's something not right about it, um, even when they were not talking about actual negative consequences. Okay, so what can we conclude from these experiments? I think it's clear that even very young children, preschool children, at least by four years of age, if not earlier, understand the functional value of digital tracking devices. They get that um, you know, if you use computers in this really cool way, uh, you can find things that are lost. And you know, they, they understand the benefit of that, and um, they're all on board in terms of using digital tracking devices for that function. But the privacy concerns and the potential dangers, uh, that doesn't seem to enter into their, their calculus here until about six to seven years of age. And children up through 10 years of age are completely untroubled by a stranger tracking their possessions or even themselves. Remember, like one of the uh, items was their own elbow. Um, and we did not find differences for the elbow item than for the other items. College students, in contrast, view this as highly negative. Um, and I would say that given how early sensitivity to ownership comes in, as I said, by two years of age, children have very precise expectations about one, what one may and may not do with objects that one owns. Um, it, this is, I think, a, in some ways, a surprising lag. Now, there's uh, an important open puzzle that I wanted to uh, bring to your attention. So, you know, we looked at children of these different ages, and like, to me, they all seem young, like even the college students, you know? Um, so they, they, I kind of think of them, oh, they're all the same generation. But they're not really all the same generation. The college students, um, ah, frustrating. Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't actually, you don't actually need to see the slide for me to make this point. So the college students, um, they actually grew up in a different uh, technological environment than these four and five year olds, or even up to the 10 year olds. You know, the technology is changing so rapidly. Uh, the kinds of capabilities that there are for um, not just tracking, but also for the everyday person to do this kind of tracking have really changed. The public nature of it has changed in the lifetime of those college students. Um, and the four and five year olds take it for granted. So what I have, there are these developmental effects or are they cohort effects? I don't know the answer and I think it's a really important question. So if it's a developmental effect, what that means 
is that these four and five-year-olds are going to change how they think about this, and by the time they're college students, they'll look just like the college students that I, uh, whose data I reported today. Uh, in other words, they're just not sophisticated yet in thinking about virtual uh, technology, the, the privacy concerns. You know, as I uh, sketched out at the beginning, there are different privacy considerations for, for virtual information as opposed to actual physical objects. And maybe that's something that kids have to get to a certain point in their reasoning capacity to appreciate. Um, and so that may just be a developmental change. Um, and you know we have to help kids and protect them when they're in that early age before they understand kind of the, the potential negative consequences. But the other possibility is that there are cohort effects and that, in fact, the, that these kids may be the tip of the iceberg or the canary in the coal mine or use whatever uh, metaphor you wish, that um, you know, the, maybe the way this new generation is thinking about technology is really different from somebody from a different older generation who didn't grow up with that. And I'm reminded of this kind of every day when I see what people post on their blogs. And I remember uh, back to when I was a kid where if you had a diary, you kept it shut with a lock and key. Um, and so there's you know, potentially like really a very different perspective on what privacy means and whether to value it or not and whether there, this is a moral, morally loaded issue or not. So um, one way to test whether are people growing up at different points in time showing different um, sorts of beliefs here, or is it a developmental change, uh, will be you know, to, to keep tracking this to see what happens uh, you know, five, five or 10 years with these children who grow into that older age group. And, you know, are they going to look qualitatively different? I, okay. Yeah, so I think there are uh, a couple of points, I, uh, hopefully fairly obvious to you at this point, but um, uh, two considerations, I think, for the future. So one is, uh, I think that these findings do raise questions about children's digital safety and security. Um, we see that young children don't have that healthy skepticism that adults have, uh, so they can be vulnerable to those who might exploit them to track their location, to obtain private information. If you think about it, if they don't think it's bad, they're not going to do anything to protect themselves. And um, thank you. The next point is, I think, then this raises an urgent question for the future about how to protect children. Uh, maybe educating children about potential dangers, but I think there's also um, you know, a bit of attention there in not wanting children to be afraid of the world around them, so it's very delicate. It's not an easy kind of uh, education to, uh, to engage in. Um, but maybe also providing clear guidelines and limits for how and when children's phones and their accounts should be shared with others. Um, you know, it, it, and again, it's, that's a difficult one as well because parents uh, often want to have their children trackable in case, you know, God forbid anything should happen. Um, so. So I, I don't have the answers here, but I think they're ones that we have to grapple with. Um, so I wanted to thank you. I want to thank my collaborators, Natalie Davidson, uh, Megan Martinez, and Nick Knowles, uh, who are collaborators on this research, and uh, my lab, the, all of the participants, the families who participated. And I wanted to give a shout out to um, the University of Michigan Living Lab program, which conducts uh, science out in the open in local museums, such as the Ann Arbor Hands-On Museum. We have tables set up, and uh, visitors who come to the museum, if they wish, they can come and uh, participate in our research, and it's a really nice way to do outreach and uh, communicate science to, to the public. 
So thank you very much. I'd like to open it up for questions for Professor Gelman. If you'd like to come, step up to the microphone and ask those, and we'll go uh, take turns across however many there are. Yes, hello. Um, very interesting. Um, the question I have is the way I understood your presentation. It's more like when I have young kids, so. Kid likes the bink, the pacifier, that kind of stuff. It's always nice for the parent to have, to track the pacifier, so on and so forth, and it's good. But as they get older, I want to make sure I have it in my hand so older brother doesn't take it away and so on and so forth. Um, I was wondering, did you take any look into the other aspect of it and switching to the uh, diary kind of example is, okay, I've got a diary and I've got stuff in it. If you give me a thousand bucks to read your diary, mm. um, what, how does that change the answers? Um, and, no, and then the difference between just let me read it, oh, and then on top of that, I just might tell other people about it. And how does the... I don't want to say monetary value, but the, the benefit value saying there's kind of a difference that if you give me 20,000, I'll let you read it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I love that question because I think, um, so, you know, I would say in general, in the last 20 years, a lot of research uh, has revealed that young children are much more sensitive to kind of subtle variations in the kinds of cues that people are giving them than we used to think. Um, and I think I, I would expect that children may be very sensitive to those sorts of, you know, kind of, um, you know, if you up the benefits, then they, they may accept it more. If you um, uh, either decrease the benefits or amp up the potential costs, that that would change their consideration. They're very kind of, you know, children are surprisingly um, sort of rational in the t decisions that they make. We don't think of kids as rational, but if you, you know, if, if you switch around the outcomes for them and make those clear, they respond to those. So on the one hand, I'm, my reaction to your question is, what a great set of research questions that would be, because we don't know, as I, I, mean, I mentioned at the beginning, we know almost nothing about how kids think about privacy. Um, and you know, what are the contexts that, that shift them from thinking about privacy one way or another? So uh, the kinds of manipulations you're suggesting would be awesome to do. Um, and then on the other hand, I, I think, well, uh, this ties into my point at the end, which is like, how do we want to educate children about this? Because I think what my studies are showing is that in the absence of explicitly kind of giving them incentives uh, of one sort or another, their default is, um, you know, it's good for these, these tracking devices are good because they have a function and I can totally see how I could uh, get my stuff if it's lost. And the, the costs are just not, in their mind at all. Um, and I think then the implication is, you know, if you offered them, it, since they're already not concerned about privacy, and then you gave them some incentive to share their stuff, I think they'd be like, great, sure, give me the Probably. money. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Hi, right, thank you for your talk. Um, have you considered, or, or are there other researchers that you've sort of talked with or communicated with exploring the difference between American kids and how they think about tracking versus European or uh, kids in Asia, uh, especially, you know, perhaps kids in the UK where there's a pervasive video surveillance network in London. And in most cases, that's deemed to be good because it prevents a lot of other potential problems. Yes. Um, that is also such an important question. Um, so I am a huge believer in looking at development in different cultural contexts. Um, and I have not looked at it with respect to this digital 
privacy issue, but I would love to know the answer to that. So like in my work on language development, I've collaborated with um, uh, researchers where we've looked at kids in China, where we've looked at kids in the mountains, the Andes Mountains in Peru, uh, where we've looked at kids growing up in India. Um, and we often find um, important differences. And in fact, we, we even have some research in Michigan where we find important differences. So uh, not having to do with digital privacy, but in one of our projects, uh, we looked at two communities. One was Ann Arbor, another was a small rural community within an hour of Ann Arbor, and found very different developmental patterns in how they think about uh, categories of people in that case. So I have every reason to believe that the results that we have here, you should bracket as kids in the US in this Ann Arbor community at this point in history. Um, which is, so I, I would not want to assume that this is uh, kind of a universal way of thinking about digital privacy. And then from, you know, just a researcher perspective, I think these kinds of um, c contextual comparisons are a really powerful way of trying to understand the mechanisms or the, the factors that lead kids to think about things one way or another. Because when you see differences, then you can start to investigate what's causing those differences. So I really appreciate that question. Um, and I guess the final uh, point that I wanna make in response to what you asked is uh, a paper just recently came out this year that looked at developmental psychology research um, published in the top journals. And it was very depressing because something like 95% of the studies are done with either um, kids in the US or European American kids. Um, and we, know, we don't know enough about variation in other parts of the globe. Thank you. A uh, question I have for you. Uh, first of all, the point about the cohort by age be, potentially being a factor, I thought was really, really good. What is wondering though, I don't know what your sampling strategy was, but it seems like when you were comparing the college kids, they're automatically very heterogeneous versus the preschoolers who are probably not so much. I was just wondering if you'd kind of address that. Yeah, I think um, I will say that the, you know, we had you know, pretty small samples in these studies. So there's no way that we could get, you know, they weren't nationally representative in any way. Um, and we didn't gather any data on individual variation in, um, you know, uh, education level, socioeconomic status, as you point out, you know, they're college students, they're U of M college students are like a very select group. Um, and so I think, you know, this is sort of the first step. And what I would want to know is, um, I mean, it's consistent with the other surveys that I kind of alluded to at the beginning, which show that generally adults in the US do report that they're concerned about privacy issues. Um, but, you know, even those surveys sometimes find cohort differences. Like if you look at the older adults answering those surveys versus the younger adults, you sometimes see differences in their attitudes. Uh, let alone people who maybe, how about those people who have lots of devices but lots of resources for kind of like um, uh, making sure that uh, they're only using, say, their own Wi-Fi service when they're in the home and they, they kind of know that that is protected versus somebody maybe who all they have is a, a cell phone and they rely on it for all kinds of things and they're, they're, not, able to be, they're not able to protect their information in the same way. So I, I, I think, um, you know, this is kind of, uh, uh, it's a first step and we would want to know what's, what are the range of attitudes and beliefs out there in an adult sample and can, do we see that it varies as a function of some of these factors? So um, yeah, I mean that, that would be, I think, really interesting to explore. Thank you. Hi there. I liked your presentation and I just had a question for you. Um, it's been my experience that children seem to be more compliant when they're interacting with an authority figure, someone who's older. They 
put trust in that person to act on their behalf. Um, and I couldn't help but notice that the stranger in the presentation was Sam, had a gender neutral name. Um, in your presentation, there was a picture of a little boy, but I assume based on the reactions that they had that that was either a girl or a boy, depending on the person. So mm -hmm. I was yes. going to ask you if replacing Sam with another person, someone who might not be in their class, say, if that would elicit more of a feeling of unease or discomfort um, and the tracking. I feel like as yeah. adults, we have a better grasp on the threats that are out there. And so I was wondering if that came up in your study at all. Uh, this is something that I really want to do next, actually. First of all, about the method, you're absolutely right. We uh, deliberately chose a gender neutral name. The female participants uh, saw a female Sam, and the male participants saw a male Sam, just because um, uh, we didn't want to add another factor of whether the gender was the same or different. But to your more general point, I think that is, um, it's exactly what we've been thinking about, the relationship of the person to um, this other. And, you know, is it a stranger? Is it someone who's potentially more threatening, uh, like an adult? You know, other kids are probably, I mean, to be, to be honest, other kids are probably not going to be, you know, stealing uh, someone's information or trying to kidnap them or something else. So there's, in a sense, there's a, a reality uh, to the kids trusting this, this stranger. Um, I could also imagine all kinds of ways of varying features of that stranger, and it could, it could be also a way of tapping into whether kids um, are being guided by stereotypes about other people, or what, you know, what are the kinds of uh, cues that you might give that would get kids thinking about um, you know, privacy concerns. Um, we also know from, from other research that's been done recently that kids care a lot about the relationship between two people, and it affects uh, all kinds of things about their interactions, including how much they're willing to share physical resources, not virtual informational resources. Um, so for example, people in the same family are highly trusted, and they're, they're willing to share all kinds of things with them. Uh, same with uh, people that you know who are like in your class, uh, but then if you have people who are, um, you know, more distant, not someone that you interact with, then that's where you see, uh, wh where you see kind of more distrust in the realm of, of, of physical interactions. So I think it's a great question, and uh, I think it, it absolutely would be useful to play around with that and see um, if kids are kind of, they may be more trusting when it's an adult, because as you say, adults are authority figures, or they may be less trusting of adults because they know that adults have these capabilities that uh, children don't have. One last question. Hi, um, I've read that um, children, um, when they're being asked by a question by like an authority figure, that sometimes they can tend to produce the answer that they think that um, the person asking wants to hear. Um, do you think that this was a factor in these experiments at all, or did you do anything to try to account for that? Yeah, no, that's, that's a really uh, important point. Um, I will say I don't think that this, that was going on partly because the results came out very differently from how we expected, uh, because we thought there would be more sensitivity. We were really surprised, for example, that the eight to 10 year olds were so positive about these other tracking uh, situations. Also, we had trained research assistants who uh, understood you know, fully what the research question was and the methods, but they did not know what our hypotheses were going into the study. So that was intended to be another kind of protection against this very important issue that you're raising. Thank you very much for your presentation. I apologize for the technical flaws. Oh, no problem.